Okay, why don't we get going? So this is sort of a special edition, uh, <laughs> a pandemic edition of the worldwide, the PGC Worldwide Lab Meeting. Um, I'm very pleased to be on this call with uh, Professor Cynthia Bulick, who's the a UNC eating disorders researcher, also works at Karolinsk Institute and um, chairs the PGC Eating Disorders Group. Um, she's also upstairs for me right now, and so we're trying not to kill our home bandwidth. Um, so uh, first of all, to get started, welcome everybody. We've got 25 people on the line and it's being recorded as always. Um, if people have a question that you'd like Cindy and me to give an answer to, or to, you know, whatever it might be, a lot of the things we've handled before are about coping, about pandemic, et cetera please put it into the Q and A box below. If you go down to the, the, the bottom of the Zoom link, the bar, there's a Q and A section and please put a question in there. And I'm gonna share screen and pull up the talk that Cindy and I put together for today. Okay, and full screen. Okay, so the agenda for today is you know, first of all, as I mentioned, please go ahead and put in a question if you have one. Um, and it's possible to do so anonymously. Um, some things we're thinking about, and in the discussion section, I'd like to get some opinions on this. We're thinking about moving the PGC Worldwide Lab Meeting to weekly. Um, the ADHD group gave a session two weeks ago, and it had like 100 plus attendees, which was huge for a talk like that. That actually set the PGC record for this. The previous high was when the director of the NIMH talked. And so I think this is something that, you know, to get more science into this would be actually really helpful. But to do this, we need your help. We need you, I, I can't pester everybody to do it. We need the group leaders to come together and to volunteer to say, right, we've got four people that'll give a talk and then we can work out the schedule, et cetera. So volunteer. Um, send an email right now to your group chair saying, hey, we should do this. Second, um, I'm, I've been thinking about doing a PGC training series. Essentially, this would be a list of some 20 odd lectures that would basically explain the PGC to a new person. As part of our five year agenda, we want to bring a lot of, we want to do a lot more data collection at a lot more places. And that means we're going to have tens or dozens or more new investigators coming to PGC. And I think to have something that's recorded that basically explains everything that we do, you know, the history of the PGC, how we work, how you get access to data, you know, how do we, the background of site genetics, the, what heritability means in this context, how do we define phenotypes, how do we ascertain sample, et cetera. How do, what's genotyping mean? How do we do it? What's quality control? What's imputation? Really, we could easily get, by spreading the load, we could put together 20, 25 lectures that would basically form a, a PGC curriculum. And I'd like to move in this, but obviously I can't do it all myself and we'd have to have a lot of people volunteer to help. But I think many of us actually have these lectures already, so it would not take a huge amount of work to do it. Um, we've been thinking about setting up informal hangout series with senior people. Um, just basically a time when the heads of a group or a couple of senior people will be on the line and people can drop in and ask questions or chat or whatever. Um, we've arranged for an invited review series with the journal. Basically, they've, we've commissioned something like 11 different um, reviews that we're going to try and get going. Um, basically, head, we're, we're going to try and, and have it targeted for really early career researchers so they can get an invited review on, on, on their CV. Okay, so those are the things that we're thinking about, but I really wanna know what the community thinks. The next thing is Cindy's gonna, we, we've done some stuff on stress and coping, and we'll talk about that. Um, we've done, Cindy has done some really cool stuff with Jen Kirby here at UNC on coaching, and she'll talk about that. And then finally, we'll go through, the, the bulk of the talk will be actually on the, the survey that we did. We got 130 odd um, responses to the survey we put in. Okay, so let's uh, go to stress and coping. Just to remind people, um, there's a couple of resources right now. So first, if you go to YouTube um, and search for Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, you'll find our channel. And there's two talks, this, the, the one with Talia 
and with Sam Meltzer Brody on it. One talks about just, th this was the panel discussion we had about stress and coping. And this was the one about uh, you know, larger picture stuff about how do you deal with a career in at this time. There's some really good stuff here. I encourage people to look at these if you haven't. In addition, on this um, Google Drive, um, uh, uh, there's a bunch of things that people have found useful. Um, this is a template for how to basically set modest, reasonable goals per day and per week to keep oneself on track. Um, there's a bunch of pro tips here, which are things that we put together to sort of understand, you know, what, what to answer common questions. Um, there's some instruments um, here that are basically standard ones to measure the degree of anxiety and depression. And if I've been telling people that if these are an issue for you, do these things once a week or once every two weeks. And if things start to get out of hand, and if they stay out of hand, then it might get to the point where we might want to consider doing something about it. So these are resources we put together that people have told us are useful. And I'm going to turn this over to Cindy to describe the, the coaching thing that you and Jen Kirby have done. Sure. Thanks, Pat. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, this has been a pretty um, amazing thing to be involved with. Um, Jen Kirby is a clinical psychologist. And she and I have worked together developing treatments for the past decade. So we developed couple-based treatments for eating disorders. She's a specialist when it comes to sort of the development of manualized treatments. And Pat and I were taking a walk several weeks back and we were like our early career researchers, um, especially the moms um, who are at home with kids right now, really need support, help, guidance, um, and a safe space where they can talk about some of the challenges that they're dealing with right now during the pandemic. And I said, the only person for the job is really Jen Kirby. Um, and a process that usually takes us a year or so, we sort of did in 48 hours. And we put together a curriculum um, and just yesterday finished our first round of, um, of coaching. We had, I think, seven or eight um, early career research moms um, who were in a coaching series. And by all accounts, it was a pretty positive and really, I think the word that was used often was actually a healing experience. Um, and we've already got one question in the question box about you know, how much should an investigator reveal about how much difficulty they're having right now. And I think one of the things that was really helpful was that it was a safe space to talk about that. Um, and also to get some skills about how to deal with just the unfamiliar array and confusion of thoughts and feelings that people are having. Um, so we decided we're gonna do two prongs in terms of how this is gonna go. Just giving this to eight people isn't enough. Um, so we're gonna do an informal track where next week at this time, we're gonna do a train the trainers um, sort of seminar. Um, and would love to have you all um, either find people or yourself um, come to that. Um, we will give you the curriculum, we will give you the slides, um, and then you can go off and do this for people who you think would benefit from it. We designed it, or the first time we did it, it was for moms, but it can be adapted for anybody. Um, but I think it's important to have the group be somewhat homogeneous because they were all dealing with some of the same issues of how do I remain sort of like productive in research while I'm homeschooling my children, while I'm babysitting my two-year-old. Um, and those are pretty specific to, um, to young parents at home. We think the people who would make good trainers, psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, therapists, it's good to have some CBT and DBT experience because those are really the skills that we try to convey. Um, knowing how to work with groups, um, Zoom groups are a little bit different than therapy groups, um, but your group training is going to come in handy. Um, and also the ability to distinguish between coaching and therapy, because this is very much focused on coaching, um, not getting into um, the real therapeutic side of what people are dealing with now, although the elements of therapy are definitely there. So next week, we will give people slides, we'll walk you through the curriculum, um, and then in parallel, we're going to be trying to formalize and manual, manualize this more um, and hopefully put it on an online platform so that we can disseminate it more broadly. Um, so Pat and Tammy will send around details about how to sign up for that next week. Right. Thank you, Cindy. So I, I've 
I was, I've been super impressed by this, um, just with how quickly and how well this has gotten spun up. Um, and I, I believe that um, you know, the feedback you've gotten from the people that did this first has been uniformly positive. This has been, I think, for a lot of these people, super, super helpful and very worthful and, you know, uh, a very, you know, amazingly important thing to do at this point in time. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, and I think the other thing about it that's great is um, it sets the stage for a more prolonged relationship with the group members. So it's sort of naturally rolled into let's keep doing this um, because this isn't something that's over now. Um, and it's a great way for early career researchers to keep supporting each other over time. You know, they, yep. they developed a network over the eight or nine sessions that we had. Um, and now they're going to continue relying on that network um, to help each other through what might very well become, you know, the next couple of years. Yep. So let me, I'm looking at the list of, of people on the call right now. And so I'm going to pick on um, a few of you. I hope that's okay. Just as illustrative only. So for example, Catherine and Howard are on the call. Um, and, you know, my understanding is that your background is not in psych clinical psychology, for instance. But what you could do is if you have a group of people that, you, that work for you, early career researchers or whoever might be appropriate, um, you might be able to sort of talk with them about forming a group and then try to identify using your own resources uh, a some, you know, potential trainer that meets the criteria listed there. Um, and so basically the, the boss could help get this organized and then let it go after that. In other words, you, you get it set up and then it's off and you're not involved it further. In addition, another way this might go is that some of you um, on the call, early career researchers, I'm looking at Paola and Neve and uh, Marty and uh, Louis and other people on the call, you guys might come together and form a group. And if you form a group, then you could find or, or you could talk to a psychiatrist or psychologist in your network about finding a potential person that might be a trainer for the group that you guys organize. So this could be done in several different ways, um, but we certainly would encourage people to try this because it looks like it's actually been a very useful thing so far. And Saul, can I answer one of the questions in the chat real quickly, because sure. it's pertinent? Yep. Um, the question is, I wonder why only mothers need this kind of support. Don't fathers and your, sci and your scientists might need that as well? Oh, absolutely. Um, it just happened that our first group um, ended up all being current moms. Um, but there is no question that this kind of support is necessary across the board. And it's actually not just early career scientists as well. Um, you know, I think a yep. lot of, everybody is struggling. So, you know, I think yep. there's room for this to actually be disseminated across the board. Um, and if a group of senior scientists want to get together um, and do this as well, absolutely. I think the curriculum is really flexible and adaptable to whatever the needs of the group is. Or are. Absolutely. And let me just emphasize that to, the, to, to answer the question in a different way. We started with just something that was relatively narrow, yeah. relatively um, immediate. And that was just from practicality. We had never done this before. We needed to develop it. We had to start somewhere. This was a logical place to start. Um, but as Cindy has mentioned several times now, this can be adapted to you know, virtually any reasonable context. And I certainly agree that fathers and other scientists need this too. So I think it's something that uh, that we should definitely it can it can be used in lots of different ways. Okay, so um, we can come back to this if people have other questions. Um, but let's go to the survey. So about two weeks ago, we we Cindy, can you describe where the survey came from, please? Sure. Um, so the. Editor of the International Journal of Eating Disorders, Ruth Weissman, and Kelly Klump, one of the associate editors, did this for the eating disorders field. Um, and I got the I got their survey as an eating disorders researcher, and I said, "All right, we need to see if we can adapt this for the PGC." And Ruth and Kelly um, graciously gave us their Qualtrics um, form, and we were able to adapt it pretty much overnight for the PGC, and then get it out into the field. Um, and the main point behind it was A, to find out what struggles people are having right now, and then more importantly, what we can do to help. Um, and so the way, as we go through this, Pat's going to go through some of the quantitative information, and then I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the free text answers that we got um, in terms of what we can really, how we can be of assistance. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, the respondents were a max of 131, um, lots of variable response rates, so 80 to 90 was typical for a question. Um, surprisingly, um, this actually ended up being, 75% uh, you know, of people were basically um, tenured um, or, or permanent contract or position that wasn't in. Um, so we, we, we had thought that basically it'd be a bit more junior, but these were relatively senior people. Um, psychiatry and genetics were the departments that predominated. Um, there were more females than males, and we had got responses from 50 different, different countries. So the first question I'm gonna present here is, um, to what extent has COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic shut down or suspended PGC research? Um, and 71% said that it had some impact. Um, most people said that it was like 20 to 40% or, you know, under 40% of their research was hit. A few people said 100%, but mostly it was, uh, uh, you know, definite, definite impact, although not overwhelming. Now, the next thing is uh, we asked three questions about the impact on uh, future funding for PGC research, on career in terms of promotion and or career advancement, and highest level of stress. What I'm showing here is the overall mean. So, and this is on a scale of zero to 10, zero, no concern, 10, max concern. Um, everybody has had, is worried about, it, at least to some extent, about impact on um, funding, impact on promotion, and impact on stress. Now, what I'm showing here is the mean among uh, the uh, self-identified females and males, and I'm highlighting where there was more than a two-point difference. So on funding, pretty similar. Um, big uh, gender split here, uh, where this, uh, women were a lot more concerned than males, um, and higher levels of stress had been experienced as well. Now, these questions were a series of questions on the effects of COVID-19 on PGC-related research. And, so, and these are ranked by the overall mean, and I've highlighted the ones where there was a two-point difference between males and females. So uh, you know, in this group, um, animal research, supply chain, work from home, these were relatively, the technological aspect of work from home were relatively low um, levels of concern. That's because I think we don't have a lot of lab-based scientists here. Um, you know, if, you, if you have a big mouse colony and if you, know, you need a complicated supply chain to do your science, um, then that becomes a problem, but that's not what the PGC is. Um, some concern about delays, some budgetary concerns. Staffing is, is starting to mount in terms of how concerned people are. These are the means, by the way. Um, uh, the remote stuff, of course, is concern. But when we really start to get to the sharp end, it's really these four. And, and the first one is disruption from work from home. So childcare, close quarters, domestic stuff. Overall, 4.6, but a big um, gender split. Much more of an issue for females than males. Um, slowing of recruitment was a particular issue for males where they thought that was a big issue. Um, data collection measurement problems, again, everybody's concerned about that. And cancellation of career opportunities is a real concern, um, particularly for women. Um, and then there were other things that people mentioned, um, clinicians having to just basically be dominated by clinical work, uh, emotional struggles um, related to isolation, Immigration status is something that I think um, hadn't occurred to me, but I can certainly see how that's a, that's a major issue for some people. Um, and then uh, time zone, uh, inability to focus, um, more meetings than ever because collaborators don't have, have travel or clinical duties, and then time zone discrimination. That's, that's been a perpetual issue for the PGC. Okay, and then Cindy, you wanna take over this part. This is the qualitative stuff. Or you might want to kill your video, Pat, because we're having sure. bandwidth issues. Okay, so I will go through um, the free text answers. So the first one was to share your most effective strategies for dealing with COVID-19 in terms of your PGC research. Um, and really the theme that came out most was communication, communication, communication. People were talking about using Zoom to connect with their team, um, to provide support for team members, to do regular check-ins, not necessarily on work, but just on general well-being, 
Um, and then the use of team slacks and team githubs to just keep the communication going, to, especially to keep um, early career researchers from feeling isolated during this time. Next. Um, the second one that came up in a lot of different ways was um, revising goals, um, reducing your goals, lowering your expectations of yourself and your staff, understanding that there are going to be disruptions, um, and also this sense of reminding yourself that everyone's in the same boat, um, that everyone's productivity in one way or another is going to be lower. And part of the conversation that came out about this was um, people saying, you know, I'm really going to be affected because of my situation, but other people are going to do fine. And one of the ways that I often heard it was I've got kids and that makes it really hard and the people who don't have kids are going to be super productive. Um, but that doesn't seem to be necessarily happening because even the people who are alone are having difficulty focusing um, and really being as productive as, you know, as they would hope they would be able to be in this situation. Self-care came up a lot, um, and the three biggest ones were sleep, exercise, and chocolate. Um, so um, I think probably, interestingly, alcohol did not come up, which I think is probably a good sign. Um, but people just saying how important it was to focus on self-care. Another one that came up very frequently was the importance of keeping your routine, um, even when the days all seem to run together and not be able to be distinguished um, from each other. Keeping regular hours, keeping a schedule, making a list every morning, both for yourself and for your family members, um, like your kids. Lots of people talked about honoring their circadian rhythms, um, and probably not when you have kids who interrupt them, um, but really trying to tailor your homework to when you're most productive. Um, and then also, I thought really a smart one was scheduling your Zoom in blocks so you don't just get Zoom fatigue from having eight hours in a row of Zoom meetings. Also frequent was disengage from the news. Um, more than once, people said, don't listen to the White House briefings. Um, try not to focus on the mortality statistics um, and do an experiment and take a news holiday. Um, and just see if you feel better overall if you go for a couple days without even looking at COVID-related news. And also focus on projects with good momentum. So people talked about how much more difficult it was to get things started up during this time, but if you have something that's already rolling, it might be a good time to sort of alternate your attention and focus more on the things that already have some steam behind them. And another theme that I thought was really heartwarming that came out was um, helping other people. Spending time helping people who were at risk of losing their productivity. And there was just a theme of how generosity, um, not you know, with your time, with your effort, with your knowledge, can actually um, help get through this period. And then this was just a, there wasn't a whole lot of response to this question. It's like, what's been effective in transitioning your PGC research to online settings? Um, one person said, use your institutional resources. You know, all of our universities um, have come forward giving us research uh, resources for this transition. Um, know what they are and use them. Um, some people mentioned Microsoft Teams. Um, and also just reaching out to work groups that have been successful in doing online recruitment if you need to transition your recruitment online. Um, and that's something that Eating Disorders Group is very happy to share information about. And then this was the, what are your institution's policy changes um, about performance evaluations of researchers? Lots of people have said that they've gotten this increased tenure clock by one year. Um, but we actually had a conversation in our department about this yesterday. And the real question is, is one year really enough? Um, because, you know, we're already almost half a year into this and, you know, there's going to be a lot of disruption for a long time. Um, and this is going a little bit outside of the, the survey, but one of the things we talked about yesterday in my departmental meeting was all of us who were on tenure and promotion committees being very vigilant about this for the next several years people who have had the illness, people who have been in care tanking positions, and the impact it's going to have on, on work products and productivity in general. Some universities have actually added a section to the CV to, so that people could describe the challenges that they had during the, um, the pandemic um, and some stop the, stop the clock policies for childcare. 
Some universities have actually revised tenure and promotion requirements. I didn't get more detail on that, but I think whenever we can share these things that our universities are doing, it's really valuable. Um, and some universities have been postponing some internal deadlines, presumably for funding um, or other um, promotion related activities. Uh, these are the one to three changes you expect to make in your research practices a result, as a result of COVID-19. Lots of people talked about having to transition to online recruitment. Um, some differences and changes in terms of sampling, having to wear PPE, having to be more careful when you're dealing with samples, or actually having to suspend blood sampling. Um, I know we've had to suspend um, fecal sample collection um, during up until now. Hopefully we'll be coming back online soon. There have been fewer face-to-face -face collaborative meetings. Um, some people have found their actual sort of research, um, how much research they're doing changing because they've gotten engaged in COVID research on top of what they're already doing, which is rewarding, but also just um, increases how over one, overwhelmed one can feel. Um, hiring delays, delay in hiring postdocs. Um, many universities have hiring freezes. And some people talked about just feeling less motivated overall um, as a general response to feeling overwhelmed and depressed and anxious about what's going on. And some folks were talking about having to look for other jobs. And then this is about what can the PGC do? And these are in order of the frequency with which these points came up. The first one was data access. Um, and some of the comments were make it easier, um, make permissions easier to get, prioritize access for early career researchers and those with caregiving responsibility and extend time limits um, if people haven't finished the work that they um, said they were going to do within a certain amount of time. Um, raise awareness of the impact on caregivers now and in the future and this is like I was saying that we talked about in our departmental meeting um, early career researchers, women and mothers, anybody with elder care, anyone who is a caregiver um, really helping people develop ways to present this information when they come up for tenure and promotion um, that will not hinder them, but rather help them. Um, and I think a scenario that people talked about very often was, you know, what happens when two people at the same level come up for promotion at the same time, and one of them really had complicating circumstances during the pandemic, and the other one really sort of in some ways came off scot-free. Um, and how is that going to impact their future career? And I think that's something that we all need to talk seriously and often about. Teaching and mentorship, and this fits in really nicely with what some of the, some of the stuff Pat was saying on the first slide about what the PGC is going to do. Everybody wants more teaching. So they asked for more webinars, more, that's supposed to be worldwide labs, um, not worldwide wrestling. Um, lots of people asked for more statistics training, more video talks and updates online mentorship opportunities, um, and a request to be more inclusive of newcomers. Um, so this, this was really one that really sung out to me when I was looking through the results. And money. Um, is there any way that the PGC can help with small grants? Any way to waive PG, um, WCPG registration um, and funds for postdoctoral fellowships and for postdoc research? and leadership opportunities. And this was a theme that came out. People were concerned that because of being waylaid um, due to the pandemic that they were going to um, lose out on leadership opportunities, um, whether that's because they had a lot of clinical duties during this time or a lot of caregiving duties during this time. Um, so I think this is something we hear often. It's like, how can I get involved with PGC leadership? Um, and I think we've got some good guidance on that, but the more we can disseminate that and make that clear, I think it'll address this issue. And then this one is other changes. It's a continuation. How can the PGC um, support researchers? Um, analysis opportunities. Um, one, request, one possibility was transition projects that aren't completed to people who have free time who need projects. Um, additional analytic opportunities for people whose projects are stalled um, and more opportunities for those people who are outside of the core sites. So again, how do we bring more people in? How do we get people involved who don't have the advantage of having um, PGCPIs in their home sites? And use time to focus on developing deep phenotyping. Um, 
you know, people were talking about how can we really use this time when we're stuck at home and working on our computers to develop online phenotyping and develop standardized phenotyping across the different work groups. And this was also lovely. Um, I think we talk a lot about early career researchers, but someone said it would be really nice if we made sure that we checked in on PGC members who were 65 plus because they're a high risk group. Uh, request for more information about where you can access mental health resources. And again, end time zone discrimination. And then this is a good springboard for the discussion piece of um, this, uh, this session today. And this is what the questions that we should have asked. Um, and I can just go through these immigration status, um, people having feelings about those people who are talking about being super productive, um, which has been labeled productivity porn. Um, a question about whether COVID um, will make sample diversity harder to achieve. Um, not just looking at caregivers, but the impact of this um, on those of us who would have had to take on more clinical duties. What about if we got the illness ourselves, or if we lost friends or family members, so the impact of grief on productivity? Um, have there been any positive effects, like less commuting or really liking working from home? Um, and then another important question I think we all need to address is what if we don't feel safe going back to work but our institutions and bosses expect us to. And I think that was the last piece. Okay, I'm gonna stop share. So at this point, um, there's, uh, Cindy answered a question already, if you look at the Q&A about, can you go through the coaching stuff on an individual basis? Did you wanna I, amplify I can that? talk through that one, sure. sure. So um, the way I answered that was like, you know, sure, if we disseminate this curriculum, you know, we'll have the slides available and whatever. If you can find someone who's willing to do the coaching with you, um, you know, that's absolutely fine because the materials will be available. Um, the only caveat that I would say is the people who were involved in the group actually really benefited from having other people there who were going through the same thing. You know, I think they got as much from, the, from each other um, as they did from the group leaders. So, you know, unless you're super uncomfortable in a group and, you know, we need to respect that, um, then just think about whether the group setting might have additional benefits to doing it individually. Yeah, because I think the, 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 the experience of reaching out and, and finding that there's others in a similar circumstance can be a very, very important and helpful thing. Okay, um, another question in the chat box. Um, how much should investigators reveal to their colleagues and supervisors about how hard of a time they're having? Great question. Do you want me to take that one, Pat? Sure. I think this is a, this is really a, it depends situation. Um, you know, I think so many people have said how wonderful their PIs and um, supervisors have been during this time, um, but that's not always universally the case. I think people are really differentially able um, to respond and be compassionate and empathic about what other people are going through. Um, I think the one thing that we've seen not be helpful is to just try to motor through this without acknowledging how difficult it is. Um, and one of the things that we talked about in the coaching was very much being clear with your supervisors about these are the, the hurdles and the obstacles and the issues that I'm dealing with right now. Um, and sitting down collaborative, collaboratively with your supervisor coming up with a revised game plan. Um, I think it is, it is pretty much been universal experience that if you don't communicate that is when you're gonna get into trouble. Um, and by and large, people have had positive responses um, because what, what ends up being really difficult is if there's a mismatch between your expectations and your supervisor's expectations. You know, if we're recommending that you revise your own expectations for your um, output and you don't communicate that to your supervisor, um, not only is your supervisor going to be wondering what's going on, but you're also going to have that internal dissonance about, you know, what are the real expectations for myself. Um, so as we revise our own game plans, that really should be shared um, with the people who have expectations of you. Pat, you want to add? I that? guess I'd add. 
Yeah, if I could, uh, I'd add two points. The first thing is, if you're struggling so hard that you're just not able to work, and if that's been going on for a month, for me at least, that would meet my threshold to help seek. You need to talk to a pro to find out what's going on. You need to think through what your options are. If there's a diagnosis, you need to get the diagnosis so you can actually you know, work around that too. Um, so that, that's the first thing, because sometimes if this has been going on this long and it's this impairing, maybe you're depressed or, or maybe the degree of anxiety is, is actually not normal if it's, if it's too far. I mean, just we study this stuff, right? And we should be aware that if we have it ourselves, we need to do the right thing. Um, the second point I'd make is, you know, even if you've got like, I, I think most PIs that I know of in the PGC would be open to this kind of stuff, but obviously that's not 100%. There are some that are not the kind of people you'd want to talk to personal things about or emotional things. Or you might not have a relationship with somebody where that's, that's something that, you know, you feel okay doing. Usually, though, if something is going on, you often can actually talk to your HR right. and get a note put in your file or some sort of qualifier, or you can actually get somebody else to help mediate the talk with your PI. Because to some extent, you, know, you, you do have a job and you have responsibilities with the job. And if you have something going on where you can't meet those or, or, or it's, it's, it's really, really far down, I think you do just in a professional sense need to take some steps to let people know what's going on and to try to come up with a plan to help. Anything else from you on that one, Cindy? Yeah, and a lot of universities, I know UNC has several resources available for, um, for academic faculty and staff. Um, so if you, if you can check with your university to see what mental health resources they've made available, that's a really good place to start if you don't feel like you have easy access to referrals. Um, question from Howard. Um, is it okay to share some of the slides outside the PGC? Yes. So in fact, this talk is going to be posted on our, um, our, our open YouTube channel. And so, and there's, this would be the third talk like that. Um, so all the slides will be there. Um, if you want the slide deck, I'm happy to send that to you too. Um, in addition, the, the Google link that Tammy put into the chat box, um, to the PGC resources, that's an open link. Anybody can, can, can view the information there. So yes, by all means, go ahead. Um, I actually, uh, uh, Joe Piven, a colleague here at UNC who works with autism and developmental delay, um, he, he did the same thing. He sent it around to his network and they found it helpful. And in return, um, Joe and Morgan Panier, the, uh, a social worker in his group, um, added a section to our pro tips about what to do if you've got a kid with um, developmental delay or autism. And that was actually quite useful too. So, so I guess the short answer, Howard, is yeah, I'd definitely go for it. Yeah, so Sarah Medlin has a question that she put in the chat that I actually agree with. Um, she said the Zoom webinar format feels passive compared to the standard Zoom call where you can see the audience. Sure. The host can mute everyone. Um, and I agree. I mean, like from a presenter perspective right now, it'd be really nice to see people. Um, and I don't know what the technical pieces are behind that, but, you know, I think especially if we are going to be going to a format where we're talking more about these sorts of things, it would really be nice to see people. Okay. I agree. So let's see. So this is, Zoom is two flavors. It's got the standard mm -hmm. Zoom flavor, and this is the webinar version. And, and I think this is practical, like if you've got 100 people on a call. So I think for the PGC worldwide, yeah, that makes sense. You know, if, it, if it's a standard talking type thing. Like, and, but at the other extreme, like for the coaching, the trainer thing that you guys are thinking about next week, it would make, you shouldn't use this format. You should use the standard one because totally. there probably won't be that many people, yeah. et cetera. And so, yeah. So Sarah, I guess the answer is we'll try to be a little more thoughtful and not automatic about which format we use. And, and I think you're right. I think uh, we didn't know how many people were going to show up today. Um, but with the number of attendees we have, we could certainly could have done it that way. And we'll try to do that, keep that in mind in the future. Um, the top one there, Cindy, is re about productivity. Given your, f actually, let's take the last question. Because it, it, it was a reaction to the one we just answered. Or a PI might have these challenges as well. Absolutely. I mean, it, the pandemic doesn't discriminate. Um, you know, I think 
the, and I actually think it's important for us to, to realize that, you know, it's like, um, there, there's a perception that the higher you up on the, you are up on the faculty scale, the less affected you are by this. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of us who are, you know, up high on the faculty scale, scale who are also dealing with older parents during this situation or parents who have died during this situation. Um, and, you know, in, in some ways that's actually been an interesting bond across different layers and across different generations. We're all in this together. Um, and, but still, as PIs, um, it is our responsibility to look after the well-being of the people who work for us. And I know, like, with my Swedish team, we've been having, um, you know, morning or afternoon tea, depending on where you are, um, several times a week, just trying to check in and not talk about work. Um, but that is also nourishing um, for the PIs. Um, to have that time to sit around and talk with your people. And actually, in some ways, I've learned more about my people during the pandemic than I learned when we just have our usual work experiences. And that's been really fun. I've met more of their kids. I've met more of their partners. Grant, has, it's all been through Zoom. Um, but it's created sort of like this, this humane connection um, that I think has been one of the positive and unexpected outcomes of this. Pat? Makes sense. Uh, there's another Q&A about productivity. Given your findings and what we have heard elsewhere, can we be even more sensitive to the extra stresses on many women without engaging in discrimination? Awesome question. Yeah, you know, this is, this is one of those questions that is super hard to answer, and I'll tell you why. Um, because I think we have to let the data drive the answer. Um, and right now the data, even that we just got on this survey, show that there definitely are gender differences in terms of um, what people are worried about and what people are facing. Um, that is not to say that there aren't dads out there who are extremely anxious, who are um, having primary responsibility for childcare, um, and they deserve as much support as the moms do. But one of the things that we have been hearing um, is that there is still a disproportional reliance on moms um, when it comes to child care activities. They do tend to be doing more homeschooling. Um, they do um, tend to still be more responsible for the emotional well-being um, of their kids. I am so not saying this is universal, um, but I am hearing a lot more of this from women. Um, and, you know, a classic story is um, people who have divided their day up into two hour blocks where mom gets to work for two hours and then the dad gets to work for two hours and then mom gets to work for two hours. Um, and if there has been a history of the child being more going more commonly to mom for emotional sucker, even during dad's two hour period, there might still be knocking on the door or really wanting to talk to mom. And that's tough. Um, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why the coaching that we did worked well, having a group of, of moms who were in that situation. Although I can actually see um, how there would be value in having dads in that situation as well. Um, because I think it's really important to engage dads in that conversation or partners who have less of a caretaking responsibility. Um, saying, how can we share this more? I mean, I'm a couple therapist, right? So to me, it's really important to have everybody engaged in that conversation. Um, I sort of went um, off on a little bit of a tangent, but I can't even remember what the original kind of question was. Pat, what was the original question? Women discrimination increased sensitivity without that risk. Right. I mean, and the other thing that we're hearing, um, there's this article that came out um, talking to journal editors about um, they're seeing this dip in the number of papers that are being submitted by female authors and an increase in papers that are being submitted by male authors. Um, and there was a kind of unpleasant Twitter um, thread last week where some editor said, come on, people, let's come to the party and, you know, please um, review papers when they come to you. Um, and I don't know about you, but I've been bombarded by reviews over the last couple of weeks, and I'm already like up to this level of where I can't even imagine adding anything to it. Um, and you know, again, I think there's there's a compassion piece there. 
I think we have to acknowledge that people, regardless of their gender and regardless of their situation, are stressed and anxious and dealing with complex feelings um, that they may never have had before. And one of the things that, that we've noticed is, you know, for people who tend to be fairly emotionally stable, um, people are really reporting feeling much more labile. Um, you can feel okay one minute, and then a couple minutes later, all of a sudden, seemingly out of the blue, you can start feeling like really dejected and, and down and hopeless. Um, and that is a very challenging thing to deal with when you're also trying to work and look after kids. Um, and one of the things I'll, I'll share, one of the things we did in coaching, we were talking about how now um, it can feel like your emotions are more like a stew, you know, where you've got like meat and carrots and gravy and potatoes and everything just in one big pot. And we tried to work with people to try to start pulling things apart and really focus on one thing and how it's making you feel. So your plate starts looking more like, you know, a piece of chicken and a thing of beans and some potatoes. And I realize that this is very much an eating disorders metaphor, but it's sort of the way I think. Um, but just being able to separate out your feelings and focus on one thing and not that overwhelming sort of mixture of feelings and thoughts that we can all have at this point can help make things feel a little bit more manageable. I saw a uh, photo on the internet where somebody had taken one of those cans of like Italian seasoning and used a tweezer to actually separate out the oregano and everything else. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing, right? It's one big mess. Really you, you sort it out. Um, it's a tricky question and one of the things which I think um, I've been encouraging my people to think hard on is whether it's possible to um, come up with some way to um, join forces with somebody else. Mm -hmm. So for example, there's, a, um, there's a, a person in my group and when the whole quarantine thing started here in North Carolina, um, they, they had a neighbors and friends next door with two kids about the same age basically joined forces. They, they formed a co-op where they, and they, they basically have been following all the same rules together. Um, but basically it's two merged households in a sense where you've got four adults along with all the kids. And if you can do something like that, if you can safely bring somebody else into your bubble, um, that might be a useful way to, um, uh, to, to basically help get more bodies on the problem. Because if there's more bodies in the problem, then this can be something where you actually can actually eke out more time and a better schedule. But I think these are some, this is also a practical thing that people need to think about whether there's a way to do that. Um, just wanted to mention, uh, Sarah mentioned that she wanted to see, um, you know, sort of a more interactive thing. And because of that, I promoted her to panelists. So now she can tell us what she thinks. Interact. Hi. Um, and sorry, it's, it's what I am to me. Um, yeah, so I did just want to mention that it is different in many places. Um, you know, every, every country is going through different uh, scenarios and it's, it's kind of having different effects in different places. Um, and here at least, so I'm based in Australia, we're actually seeing a lifting of, of stigma around mental health. Um, mm -hmm. So basically the entire community is being told that you need to watch your mental health, you need to be doing this, you need to be doing this. And what we're seeing is in conversation now, people are now talking about having an appointment with a psychologist the same way that you might mention you're going to the dentist or you're going to a doctor for something physical. So um, it is- That's awesome. There are ways that this um, may indirectly have, you know, some positive ongoing effects as, uh, as the community starts to be able to, um, come out of the heightened level of distress. Mm. That's think, awesome, actually. That is an awesome point. And it dovetails with something that happened in our department meeting yesterday. Um, our chair said for the first time in her life history, the psychiatry department are the cool kids on the block. <laughs> it's like all of a sudden, like the ER docs are asking for, you know, sort of input from psychiatry. And, you know, and I've been saying, and lots of people have been saying all along that we're going to have a mental health pandemic right on top of the COVID pandemic, and we need to be prepared for that. Um, and I think that's true. And, you know, people are, it's a great point, Sarah, and thanks for 
thanks for saying it because you know, we've been fighting for so long to saying, you know, going to see a psychiatrist or a psychologist is no different than going to see a dentist and you should be doing preventive mental health maintenance. Um, and, you know, this isn't preventive, you know, this is very reactive, but yet it's, it is kind of cool that all of a sudden our skills can be extremely helpful. Um, and one of the things that you, that we realize very quickly is that people do not have basic sort of cognitive behavioral or DBT skills to deal with the nature and the magnitude of the thoughts and the emotions that they're dealing with right now. Um, and even just giving people small amounts of those tools can really help that sense of feeling overwhelmed and anxious. So yeah, it's a, it could be a very good time um, for our, our industry. Let's walk through a practical step that comes from this. So, so say there's somebody on the call who actually wants to get a professional contact of some type. How do they do it? Pat wants to get a professional what? Contact. They, they're, they're, they're concerned about something that's going on in their life. They want to do preventive mental health. Uh, they're, they're so anxious or they just simply can't get motivated. They can't move on. Um, they're sleeping too much. Their mood isn't great. What do they do? Practically, yeah. what are the steps? I mean, especially if you're, you know, as I mentioned, if you are in a university, I'm pretty sure every university at this point has put up um, links to resources. Um, places that you can go to get referrals. Um, every country is going to be a little bit different, um, but many countries um, have transitioned to telehealth options. Um, I know in the States there are also some, um, and someone might be able to help me think through what this is called right away, but there is now a nationwide program where you can get online therapy services. Um, and the plus of that is they have, um, they have qualified therapists who are in each state um, so you don't have to get into the whole um, working across state lines issue, which is a problem. Um, but, you know, especially if you're not able to go out, if you are still in some phase of lockdown where you can't get face-to-face -face therapy, or if you don't want to because you don't feel safe doing it, um, there are many online options now for, um, for therapeutic support. And what if people are concerned, like, like it's not just, you know, what if they're, they're really concerned? What if they're, they're having like a lot of thoughts of suicide or they'd be better off dead and, and, and they've, you know, done our little, they've taken a look at the, the depression scale and they're definitely in the sort of like, I'm depressed as hell range. What then? So typically, let me grab that one as a psychiatrist. Okay. I mean, so typically the, the port of call, the first in, in most places is to call one's primary care doctor. Mm -hmm. um, typically, you know, in, in many systems, that's the first place to go. It is in the States. It is in many Commonwealth countries. It is in Sweden. And then they can sort of, you know, advise what the next step is. Usually it would mean having an appointment. Um, often these get done remotely to, walk, to talk through what's going on. To get a diagnosis is the key thing. A good evaluation and diagnosis because that's everything. That guides what happens next. Um, the, the other thing is that yeah, um, there are some places where, you know, you can actually approach psychiatrists directly and, and tip, or, or through the HR department at, uh, at one's university or, or wherever you work. Often there's a way to go there too. Pat, the other thing is most countries do have suicide hotlines. Mm -hmm. um, and finding your national suicide hotline number is also a good way to go, especially in the moment. Um, you know, because unfortunately, sometimes these feelings do come up in the middle of the night where you don't have regular access to your GP or to your physician. And also, again, depending on where you are, people feel differentially comfortable going to an emergency room at this point, because they're balancing out the question of, um, you know, I really feel like I'm not safe. Um, and I, under normal circumstances, I would go to an emergency room, but I don't necessarily want to um, expose myself to more the potential of um, being exposed to COVID. Um, and in, in situations like that, um, those national helplines can really be helpful because those people are staffed and trained um, to talk you through those very serious situations. And they know the resources that are available for yeah. you know, true emergencies as well. And that, that's one thing that people have been seeing is that people are delaying care um, right. in a hazardous way. Um, for everything, you know, psychiatric, mental health stuff, as well as physical things. And that's got to be something that we're really, really careful about. And for her sins, um, Catherine also has been promoted to a panelist. 
Um, I think she said she moved in from the garden to her office. Sorry about that, but <laughs> anything I, you wanted to add, Catherine? I bet, uh, not a problem. It's lovely to uh, be here. I should say it's a bank holiday uh, in, the, in mm. the UK. I'm not always sitting in the garden at three o'clock on a, on a yeah, weekday afternoon. Um, but there is also some of the perks of, uh, of COVID and I, you know, when we can, we should take advantage of them. Um, I, fabulous session. I, um, I think perhaps if I could just pick up on two of the points um, that have come up. Um, so first of all, someone asked the question, I think, on chat as to whether people should talk to their PI, their head of department, their line manager. Um, and I'm, I'm all of those things. And I would say, yes, please, please talk to us. I do realize that depending on your relationship, you know, you may be, the, the amount that you would be willing to share might be different, but unless we have some idea of what you're going through, of what the challenges you're facing are, of how this has impacted your productivity, we can't do anything about it. And so please give us that information um, and we will do our best to, to help. Um, I appreciate that you know, your, your line manager, your head of department probably isn't the only person that you want to talk to. And please make sure that you're getting the support from your peers, from other people in your group, from your family, uh, from professionals, as Pat and Cindy have just talked about. Um, but you know, if we don't have the, the information, it's really hard for us to put in process things like delaying you know, promotion assessment, supporting you in the next fellowship application, or making sure that you get that extra bit of support to get that paper in that you might not otherwise uh, be able to do. Um, so, so that was one thing. I don't know, Pat, I can see Cindy nodding here. I don't know if anyone has. Um, totally totally agree. Ab absolutely, positively, totally agree. If we don't know, we can't help. And Catherine, let me ask a follow-up. I was totally agreeing. I was nodding up and down. Obviously, you couldn't see it, but Cindy was taking my place because, anyways. Um, so if somebody, you know, that reported to you, student, mm -hmm. faculty, whatever, um, student at any level, faculty at any level, you know, said, look, I'm having a really hard time and I think I need to talk to somebody mm -hmm. or I need to see a psychiatrist. What, what, first of all, would that carry, what stigma would that carry for you? And second, how would you, what would you do after that? How would you actually help the person do whatever they needed to do? Okay, um, so personally in terms of stigma, not at all. And actually it would probably explain all sorts of concerns I might have had about things not going well. And so I would much rather know there was a reason for that person, you know, not doing what they had said they would do the previous week or the previous month. So for me, that information is, oh, great. You know, I can help. We can do something about this. We can work together on this. Um, follow and up so, that, Catherine, follow mm -hmm. up. Would you, would you personally look at this any differently than if somebody had a chronic illness that occasionally took them down? Type yeah, 2 diabetes, I, bad type 1 diabetes, asthma, something. I, yeah, not at all. I, absolutely. I would hope not. Um, I mean, you know, putting aside, you know, subconscious bias and all sorts of things. But no, I, for me, that's information that, that is really useful that, that I can work with and, and help things move forward. And then path to treatment if somebody wanted to. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so in the UK, I mean, the first port of call for us is our GPs, our general practitioners, primary care, who are still working, um, but mostly by, uh, by telephone, by video conferencing. Um, universities have a whole lot of different access to care. Um, um, uh, and that's all signposted on, on the website. Um, and I think in my group, um, I think I would also suggest, well, who, who do you get on with? You know, who's a peer that you could share with? You know, not necessarily within my group, but, you know, another student, another postdoc that you would just be happy checking in on, you know, every day to see how things are going and provide that sort of informal um, network. Um, and I suppose... I mean, I, you know, I talked about being out in my garden and that's a huge luxury here. It's a beautiful, sunny public holiday here in the UK. But the people that I'm really worried about are those that, that, that 
don't have that physical environment, that family support, people mm. who are, you know, living on their own, you know, in a single room, in a shared house. Um, and, you know, those are the people that, that I try to make sure that I check in on uh, mm. more often. Mm. Pat, can I add something to that? Because Catherine, you brought up a really important point and it's not just those people who are living alone, but those people who are living in a country that isn't their own country. Um, you know, that is one of the things that I have been perhaps most concerned about, you know, especially if their country is perhaps dealing with the pandemic in very different ways than the country mm -hmm. they're living is in. And they're feeling this tension between their parents and what their parents are saying and what's happening in their country. Um, and 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 not knowing what to do or where to turn so helping those people connect with a peer mm -hmm. and i agree i've seen a lot of spontaneous dyads pop up where people are supporting each other which is super mm -hmm. um and and checking in on those people especially you know we're also running into all sorts of issues with visa problems and mm -hmm. you know and all of that so please look after your um, you know, people who are working for you, who are from different countries, who are facing challenges that you might not even be thinking about. Yeah. yeah. And also on those, I mean, we talked about checking in with, with mental health concerns and practical concerns, but you know, if you're worried about your visa, you know, talk to us, we can help support you sort that out. You know, please don't, don't worry about those things um, alone. You know, that's what universities, employers, um, line managers are for, you know, please talk to us. Yeah, and I think most of us view that these are extraordinary circumstances and extraordinary circumstances require bosses to have extraordinary responses. Hmm. It's, it's our job. And if, if people are having trouble, let us know because we'll help, uh, we'll figure out how to help if we can. Sarah, you want to say something? Um, yeah, I did just want to also mention um, there's quite a range of ways that different countries are providing support. So some people are, some places are really focused on the physical and medical uh, support at the moment, but there are other countries that um, have the luxury of being able to think more broadly and are really concentrating on mental health support. So if you're looking for some support or some strategies and you're not finding them in your local websites, consider looking to other countries, especially if you are living in another country from what you uh, would usually be in, you know, remember to look at home as well. Um, and that can have, um, you know, there's a lot of resources out there because the whole world is going through this. You don't just mm. have to stay local. Mm. Yep. Okay, if I could turn our attention to the Q&A box, there's two unanswered questions. Um, also in the COVID survey, the PGC did, you can actually see a distinct difference between the answers and concerns of females versus males. Yep. How can we deal with those issues? So Pat, the, you had the one slide that showed the actual differences, right? Yep. I'll pull it up. And my memory is that the main one was that women's main concern was issues about working from home, child care. Right. So third from the bottom, uh, uh, no, no, sorry, I lied. Um, fourth from the bottom, for women, it was disruption from having to work from home, child care, close quarters, other domestic issues. And for men, the highest ranked item was recruitment, slower than usual study signups, inability to conduct needed screenings, et cetera. Um, and the same thing was women had experienced greater anxiety, right, Pat? And that's the previous slide, yes. Yeah. Yes, a stress, sorry. So um, women rated stress 7.2, and this is a 10 point scale, right, Pat? Yeah. Yep. Um, yep. Whereas sure. for men, it was 4.7. Um, so, I mean, those are, those are substantial differences. Um, and, you know, I think that, that second slide is actually why we, we started with um, women who were working at home looking for children because they were screaming out for help. Um, and, you know, I think they need to be dressed, addressed directly. And I think one of the things with, with Catherine on, I think this is really good. Concretely, we need to talk about how we are going to deal with this in terms of promotion letters or fellowship letters or whatever, um, we need to figure out a strategy where we can talk about what the person went through in a way that doesn't lead to discrimination when it gets reviewed by a panel a year from now or two years from now. 
Um, and that's something that I think um, we can share amongst ourselves and that people in leadership positions should really come up with a strategy to deal with. Because the last thing we, we would want is something that we would include in a letter to somehow be viewed negatively and actually work in the wrong direction. Um, we need to figure out a way to present that information in a way that is supportive, um, explanatory, and doesn't lead to any sort of discrimination against people who did face problems during this time. Catherine, pop back on. Go for it. You're muted. Muted. Okay. Um, I, I absolutely agree with you, Sunday. I just wanted to pass on something that I've been suggesting to my group and teams generally is that they record that information. I mean, I think while we are in the middle of it, it's really easy for us to say, oh, it was awful and I only got, you know, X percentage of my, the work that I wanted to done last week and my mental health's been awful. But when we're writing that grant application, that promotion application in a year's time, it's all gonna be a bit of a fuzz and being able to say, for six months of 2020, I only did, you know, achieved X percent of my usual working hours or something that quantifies it because you have that information is going to be, I think, quite helpful. And, and I just want to emphasize too that, you know, look, I mean, the, the male female difference was sort of screened for a number of things, but it's also clear that this pandemic does not um, discriminate between men and women at all. That, that there's a lot of, everybody's struggling to some extent. Everybody has issues. Um, and I, I think it, it's not, it's also not a matter of gender. It's also a matter of just what people are experiencing and whether there's something that can be done to try to help. Yeah, we don't have to not help one group so that we can help another. You know, exactly. every, every, everybody needs it. Said better than I said it, thank you. Um, and then there's another chat um, where somebody says, um, living alone and normally loved alone time, but really struggling with sorting my thoughts along with grief. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, grief is a big thing that I've experienced a lot of too, just grieving for my typical life, you know, and, and that's above and beyond having lost somebody too, obviously. Cindy, you're nodding sagely. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just nodding because that, that word grief has come to taken has taken on so much more meaning now and different meaning than it normally does. You know, most of the time before the pandemic, when we thought about grief, we were thinking about, you know, someone close to us died. Um, and that had a somewhat predictable trajectory. Um, and if it deviated from that trajectory, then you had to worry about whether someone was becoming clinically depressed. Um, now, grief has become this multi-pronged entity um, that encompasses both the loss of people. I, I know I've had probably five people in my circle who have died from COVID, um, along with the fact that my dad died right before this all hit. So, um, so there's that, that real death-related grief going on. Um, and then there's this collective grief um, associated with the fact that there are people dying all over the world in unprecedented numbers. Um, and then there, as Pat mentioned, there are all these sort of like, like different types of grief for the, everything else that we've lost. Um, and you put that all together and it's almost a different emotion. Um, and it's a definitely a less predictable emotion than, than typical grief is. Um, and it is more overwhelming and it has more prongs. And I think that sort of gets back to my stew analogy where it's like so important to pull those different pieces of that out and to say, you know, the, what, the loss of what um, am I feeling today? Um, you know, like for me, the loss of being able to go skating because I usually go skating multiple times per week. And it's like, that's really a loss because that's something that gets my mind off of work and gets my mind off of whatever else. And today I'm really feeling that one. Um, versus tomorrow, you know, I might find that another one of my friend's parents died or something, and that might be the loss that I'm feeling. So again, there, there, it, it's been really helpful for me to just keep dissecting um, what is a much more complex emotion now um, than, than one typically thinks of grief as. But it, it, it really is probably the dominant emotion that people are talking about feeling at this point. Okay, are there any more questions?
Okay, so um, the the session next week will be on will be sort of limited to people that might be interested in doing the kind of coaching sessions that um, Cindy and Jen Kirby have um, come up with. Um, we'll try to get something more science related for the for two weeks from now. Um, but it would really help if the groups could actually self organize and send me an email saying, hey, we've got a package of four 15 minute talks on depression or on schizophrenia or on whatever. Um, it's, a, it's a good way for this to be, um, it's a good way for, for, for people to, to actually essentially give a conference type uh, platform talk, um, but you know, to a friendly audience to hone their message, to hone their skills and to get good practice as well as to deliver knowledge. And if, gosh, I mean, if the ADHD talk, ADHD talk two weeks ago is any, um, is any uh, my measurement or milestone, there's going to be 100 people on the call. People are desperate to get some science into their head. They'd love to hear what you have to say. But it'd be really helpful if you guys could self-organize. We have a lot of balls in the air right now, and that would really be great if that could happen. Okay, um, please join me in thanking um, Cindy Bula, Catherine Lewis, Sarah Medlin, um, for their sage words today, and also Tammy for her um, excellent organization, Tammy and Grace for their excellent organizational assistance. Pat, Sarah wants a quick, to do a quick conference pitch. Yeah, go, Sarah. Sorry, missed it. Sorry, guys. Um, so I just wanted to let you know, um, it looks like the Behavior Genetics Association, which a lot of PGC uh, people belong to or have been to at some stage, we are going to be going ahead with an online meeting. And we're going to be doing quite an innovative format where it goes for a 24 hour conference and each geographical region gets to host for eight hours. So it's an opportunity <laughs> to think about presenting at a time that you would usually be awake, cool. uh, which is very important for some regions of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so look out for um, emails about abstracts and, and so on. Sarah, if you send that to Tammy, Grace, or me, we can get it posted on the PGC venues. So Wonderful. Uh, Thank yep. you. No, that's cool. Good idea. And that would certainly be one way to handle time zone discrimination. Time zone discrimination, yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay, that's it. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate the time and appreciate the interest. Thanks, Pat.